Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Wisdom Keeper podcast, where I am delighted to introduce you to Chokshri Maya Kurtiasa, a food and lifestyle journalist based in Bali, Indonesia, and co-author, along with Chef Wayan Kresnayasa, of a newly released and acclaimed book, Pound, Real Balinese Cooking. In this conversation, we follow Maya on her pilgrimage as she heals from our modern culture of systemic disconnection and as she rediscovers her Balinese spiritual roots, transforms her kitchen into a temple, and becomes the keeper of her grandmother's sacred wisdom. This dialogue, I felt, was filled with so much tenderness. You could feel the divine uh, presence of the divine feminine. And it was filled with delightful surprises, which I'm sure you'll enjoy and will be relevant to anyone embarking on the heroic journey of personal rebirth. So before I let you get stuck into the wonderful uh, interview that we had up at Maya's personal home there, the Kurtiasa's wonderful sort of family home up there in Bali, which I miss so much and look forward to one day reconnecting with her there, a uh, very picturesque set setting, of course, Bali, a magical island. And I was invited there to give this interview several days or weeks after the uh, first interview I did with her brother, Chok Gede Kurtiasa. And so I got to very much be welcomed in by the family, and I feel so grateful and indebted to them for really opening up my eyes to the so-called real Bali. And I feel that the conversation just had a very elegant and very wonderful, very authentic and genuine cadence and tone that I really think you'll enjoy. Um, But before we get in there, I wanted to just paint a little picture of the sort of meta story behind uh, Jokshri Maya's adventure. I wanted to just remind people of this sort of heroic journey motif by Joseph Campbell, because I think it's so relevant here and it gives me an opportunity to paint that motif for you so that you can sort of really read the signs and hallmarks and landmarks of the terrain. Use it as a map to see one person's journey with the hopes, of course, that you also embark on your own adventure of transformation. Of course, distilling the mono myth as it's called which with some 17 stages into its three part phases joseph campbell offered us this sort of very simple version of the journey which includes what's called the departure and then enters into what's called initiation and then ends or completes its round with a phase called the return And whether this be a physical adventure, or it be a psychological one, or an alchemical one, the motif is the same. And this is something that I'm working on currently in my new book, Return with the Elixir, which is just to see how universal a motif this is, so that each of us feels more empowered, really. Because when you're very, very close to the trees, it can be a very daunting task. But if you are enabled or empowered to see from a more bird's eye perspective, this is is a normal, in fact, necessary adventure. And that it has universal features. It can give a level of comfort and support that is so necessary, particularly when we when we reach that sort of dark night of the soul and Sri Maya is no different she's a brave and courageous character in this story but as you listen to her story it's probably both of our hopes that you relate to it in such a way that it inspires you that it doesn't alienate you doesn't make you feel like you're the strange person having challenges or difficulties you're the strange person feeling paralyzed by the world In fact, rather the opposite, that we're all in this together. This is a sort of collective movement, even though we may be on a very personal and discreet and very individual or unique journey. This is something that all beings through the through all epochs and all cultures go through. And not just once, as I will make comments in my book later on, it's not this is more of a spiral. I myself have been on this pilgrimage many times. 
I, uh, it, it doesn't make it any easier in a way. It has to be challenging as a snake sheds its skin. Uh, it's filled with peril. It must be. Um, but it gets, you get more well acquainted or familiar with the landmarks and signs or sort of aesthetic that you're on this journey. You know what to expect. And it does provide, as it should, some measure of optimism and hope that you'll come through and you'll come through transformed with something positive to give back to our fellow human, human beings. So Sri Maya and I sat in her family home and she will, as you see, will describe, you know, what typically happens to most of us is that we get some sort of information that life isn't working, that we have become stuck, paralyzed, and in many of our cases, sick. In her case, physically sick. In the, patients, in, the, in, the, in the case of many of my patients mentally sick, the symptoms are the soul's beckoning, wishing and attempting to communicate with us. Symptoms of depression, symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of anger even, of irritation. Most of us will go to the normal, usual suspects to neutralize, n nullify, quiet or numb these symptoms and it would be like severing the dis the connection the only relay line that we have the telephone line with the soul i call it this is a time to listen if your body is breaking down if your relationship is tumultuous and no longer working despite repeated efforts if your job is a dead end and you're banging your head up against the wall holding on for dear life to that paycheck or or or, in, or insurance package but something in while something inside of you is dead then it's time for us to listen and in maya's case though she was working in the uh, food writing industry a lifestyle journalist it could be for you something very very similar that the paycheck in a way or the fame and fortune of your career path somehow reaches its na uh, its apex and it no longer you know you no longer derive that sense of deep satisfaction this is information from the soul to heed and in maya's case it was a breakdown of her body that is the sort of tipping point or the threshold where we venture forth noble one into the grand pilgrimage the departure leaving what is familiar whether it be family members whether it be a spouse whether it be a familiar job i think most of us listening to this will 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 resonate with the fact that our world in a way has also in a global way socially reached its apex it has reached its threshold this sort of expansion effort that has happened through the industrial age since the age of reason some 400 years spanning through the scientific revolution and basically through a mass globalization has now reached its tipping point we see the feedback again symptoms of the anima mundi the soul giving us feedback mother earth telling us we have gone too far. We have ventured uh, too greatly out of, out of bounds, out of balance. It's giving us a warning sign again and again and again that we need to heed and yet we don't listen. And society is the same way. Whatever social structure you want to look at, whether it be the banking system or the political system, the economic system, we are now on the tipping threshold of a contraction after a massive expansion. And everything, if you look carefully, whether it be the cosmos and the cycles of the planets, whether it be societies, whether it be institutions, whether it be your own body or even your breath, everything happens in cycles, cycles of expansion, cycles of contraction. I think if this is a very helpful way of looking at things because it normalizes even the death process, which we are amidst right now, is not to be feared but welcomed. The society is breaking down. Don't be afraid. Welcome it. 
It means if we can get our collective consciousness together, that we can actually ride the waves of the contraction, ride the waves of the dissolution, follow the signs and listen to the signs and heed the signs of the, signs of the dissolution, and venture forth into an alchemical process for a cultural global reboot, and in this case on the heroic journey, a personal rebirth. And so this is something that I want to really just emphasize at the outset of this podcast, that this motif is universal, it's apparent in, in Maya's journey, but it's really there in everybody's journey. And it's one that provides a lot of confidence and a lot of reassurance. So <clears throat> with that, I just want to uh, highlight a couple of essential ingredients about Maya's story that I think are worth underpinning or under um, emphasizing. One is that she has this wonderful reframe, which I find really emblematic of non-dualism. Non-dualism, of course, is this idea that the spiritual and mundane are really one. And most of us have been sort of conditioned by pop culture to believe that the spiritual path has this sort of, you know, ethos of transcendence. Uh, it, it looks a certain way. The yogis in the Himalayas, the practices of prayer and meditation in a meditation cave somewhere outside the bounds of the commercial world or the material world. Somehow that we have to make a massive sacrifice and venture beyond or transcend to a heaven above. This is an old archetype very common to the Piscean Age. And we are now entering into the Aquarian Age which is the age of decentralization. It is also the age of non-dualism, which means that as above, so below. The archetype of the Aquarian age is actually Ganymede, these, the, the cup bearer. And the cup bearer image of the Aquarius is to sort of pour from above that liquid ether into a stream below so that as above unites with below. The old sort of motif of the Piscean Age of two, two fish swimming in opposite directions. You know, the, the worlds between heaven and earth could never be more vast. This is the new age. And the new age means there's nowhere else to go. There's no escape. There's no escape to another, another world. The, the heaven is here and now. Gaia. Mother Earth is the abode, and we can't escape each other, as Camus might want, of, might, might want of existentially suggest to us. We have to fix this together. There's no Savior coming for us. We are each the divine Savior of our own world. We have to collectively come up with solutions. This is, the spiritual life is here and now, and Maya's sort of very beautiful, very elegant presentation of spirit, Balinese spiritual wisdom takes place in the context of the kitchen. And its currency is the, the, the currency of food. And I was so taken back uh, that I think there's a moment in there where I'm just really in awe at what Maya is really saying. I really, I really um, have my hats off to her and honor her and bow to her because it was a real confirmation not to get these idealized sort of, you know, allures of spirituality that are even, you know, even in the, the beautiful island of Bali, you can go for ceremony every day. Um, but what about the ceremony of feeding your kids? What about the ceremony of the two to three hours of food preparation? How do we transform mundane activities into the divine offering? And I think this is really one of the greatest gifts from this conversation and of Maya's new book, Pound, which by the way, if I don't, if I have it correctly, Pound is the Balinese word for a kitchen, uh, but more specifically, I think it actually translates as ashes. In other words, the ashes of the sacred fire of the hearth upon which the food is made. And if you ever wanted a more alchemical symbol than that, there you go. So her book, in a way is Maya's journey from being sick as a result of our fragmented, disconnected society, which has basically made itself sick 
on commercialization, of commodification, of eating just, just basically sugar, salt, and fat, but also spiritually deprived and spiritually malnourished. We have gone so two-dimensional and so uh, instant gratification uh, that everything has become, you know, lacks substance and lacks nourishment. And I think you'll see through her story, wherever you are, it doesn't have to be Balinese culture, but that, that was relevant and present for Maya. But wherever you are, you make an attempt to find your way back to source, find your way back to the sustenance of source of old heritage culture, maybe two or three generations ago. And I think this is the second thing that I want to mention about this conversation that I come away with is the archetype of the spiritual elder. In this case, it's so beautiful because it's a woman. It's the matriarchy. It's represented by Maya's grandmother. She is the two, two generations holder of those sacred knowledge, those, those years, bygone years where food preparation meant that people gathered in the kitchen, told stories, had deepened their intimacy, you know, shared reflections and memories. It was a, a place of communion, not just a food source of food preparation and sustenance, but spiritual sustenance as well. And I know that personally from my own background, I love to cook. And of course, my mother comes from the Middle East in areas. We've spent time in Greece and, and in Turkey. And there also you have this great culture of course, in Italy, too, the grandmothers, the nonnas, they are the keepers of the old spiritual ways. Their food preparation lasts for hours. They're the table and the plates of food and the hours of long discussion become the place of community enrichment. And we've sort of very much gone away from that in our fast food, instant gratification, you know, sort of lifestyle of distraction where one hand is putting food in our mouth and the other is with the, with the cell phone. So I'm just so, I'm just so enriched by the conversation. It's getting me excited just recollecting my time spent at the Curtiasa family home with Maya. We had lovely tea. I can, you know, just remember the birds out there and the, the thick, lush greenery of her vista and just a very lovely cadence, almost surreal time passed as we went through this conversation. And there in her pilgrimage early on, when she was ready to embark, she met the elder, was reacquainted with her elder who initiated her, the middle phase of the Campbellian hero's journey, gave her initiation into the, into the, Balinese spiritual wisdom, which became the source or sustenance that she was looking for. And then she begins to write this book with her co-author, Wyon, Chef Wyon. There's beautiful photography in the book. There's beautiful story. It's re really a patchwork or a quilt, a very aesthetic quilt of beautiful story making. I mean, she's an elegant and exquisite wordsmith, Maya is, and she's also a designer and uh, um, uh, artist, uh, as many of the Balinese people in that part in Ubud are. They have this sort of beautiful Balinese heritage of artistry, and it comes through in this book, so I encourage anyone who uh, comes ac across the podcast to reach out and try to grab a copy of this latest book, Pound. It's more than a cookbook. It is a blessing of the Balinese spiritual wisdom coming through the voice piece of the matriarch of Maya's grandmother, echoing from bygone years and calling us forward back into time to reclaim that ancient spiritual knowledge at a time where the planet needs its most and at a time where our body and mind need it most. We need that spiritual sustenance. We need that spiritual wisdom. We also need to be nurtured by whole grains and beautiful fruits and vegetables and the artistry of making food a divine offering. And so with that, I am very, very happy to just plug Maya's book because in the end of the podcast, it really is her return with the elixir her coming full circle from this adventure of her, you know, separation and the, the, the dark night of the soul of being sick, the coming into under her, the wing of her grandmother, 
her really opening to the Balinese sacred wisdom, and of course her trying it on for size and making it hers, which I think all of us must remember. We get these initiations not to replicate what our teachers have done, but to make it truly our own. And so there's a wonderful moment there where Maya and I are talking about this balance between preserving the past and innovating the past. And in my own career, I've tried to do that where I love the Tibetan cause and I'm, I'm through and through a Buddhist, uh, but I'm also a psychologist and I also work on the frontiers of trauma research and I also have these crazy interests in Joseph Campbell and alchemy and astrology and the occult. And so my you know, commitment to my own path is to respect the past, but to innovate and to make my own and to put my own stamp on it and to feel the confidence of putting that out there in podcast intros like this with the hopes that everybody out there who's listening that's going to embark on the journey and come under the care of a guide, a skillful guide, and go through an initiator, initiative initiatory period or phase and reclaim something so deep and and dark within them and dust that off and reclaim it and revitalize it will also have to come through the last phase of the return which is to really sit down with oneself and where all those echoes and fantasies that are saying you're a fraud you don't get to do this you don't get to put this out. You don't get to put out this book. You don't get to put out this podcast. You, you're not allowed to be yourself. You're, the t your, this is not your time. It is very reaffirming in Maya's movement and courage to put the book out as a sort of, a sort of uh, emblematic of claiming the sword from the stone. Yes, I affirm myself. I, I affirm myself. The, the trial I have, I, have, I have been through, I have been victorious. I've come through the other side. And now I feel the honor and the privilege to give something back. So I honor Maya in this podcast. I honor the book Pound and what it represents in terms of the sacred knowledge being delivered at a time where we need it. But I also honor each and every one of you who are venturing forth past your fears and doubts, past the precipice of the familiar into the mysterium, into the unknown, where we must trust we will be collected by guides and we will face trials and tribulations, all which are there to serve our ripening, which are there to uh, help catalyze uh, an amalgam of a new spirit or a new soul that we will then return in an avatar, a new form of ourselves in a rebirth. And we will each, we will each have something to contribute. Especially now, folks, especially now, as I look to our pilgrimage upcoming to India and Nepal, led by Geshe Tenzin Zopa and myself in October, I couldn't think of a more challenging time where there's still the reverberations of COVID, there is the omnipresent outbreak of war. There is also the pressures of the economic uh, collapse and of the food shortages and the supply cuts. Surely, surely everybody would prefer to just stay home, but a brave cohort of some 30 people have come forth. And I am mentoring all of them in small ways because each of them in their own particular ways are manifesting the signs and symptoms of doubt and fear and regression and all of the traumas are being brought to bear and this is the great possibility and opportunity of pilgrimage whether the pilgrimage be outward to a sacred destination whether they be inward on a venturing into one's uh, shadow or whether they be alchemical and energetic these hallmarks are all the same we have to push through these challenges and difficulties are ripening us. They are, they are teaching us how to let go. They are teaching us how to find confidence. They are teaching us how to find new virtues and new values. They are helping us reshuffle and reprioritizing. They help us shed the skin uh, uh, as the serpent must do again and again. And they will help us find new light within us to share with others. So with that, I hope that that inspires you. I wanna thank 
Jokshri Maya for her courage and for her offering her beautiful book. I want to find, I want to thank again her whole family. I want to thank the whole island of Bali, which gave me so much inspiration. And I want to thank all of you as you venture forth on your own pilgrimage of rediscovery. Until soon, enjoy this episode of the Wisdom Keeper podcast. So thank you for having us, Chokmaya Kirtiasa, here at her wonderful family residence in Ubud, Bali. And I've been getting to know the family. I feel extremely fortunate to have met you all on this trip under auspicious circumstances of the pandemic. And in a way, the The most important thing that has led me here is the idea of pilgrimage and having conversations with people about pilgrimage. And in a way, you've been on a great pilgrimage yourself. And you have a wonderful new book coming out, Bone, 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 yeah. which you've just recently told me is the Balinese word for kitchen. Mm -hmm. And we want to take a deep dive into your pilgrimage that led up to the writing of this book, what you discovered on the pilgrimage of this book. But maybe before we get to the book, life is a pilgrimage too. And since we're at your family home, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your childhood Mm -hmm. and maybe a couple of the major milestones that would really fill us in about how you arrived at the book, like what brought you into the book? Yes, well, firstly, thank you very much for making the time to speak with me today. It's been so, so wonderful getting to know you and and sharing, I guess, you know, a little glimmer into this pilgrimage that we've been on. And my pilgrimage, I guess, began, I would say, in my mid-twenties, so I was born in Sydney. Uh, my mother is Australian, my father is Balinese from here in Ubud. And um, I spent quite a bit of my life going back and forth between the two places and not fully grounding into either one of them. You know, I was bouncing around between the two of them a lot. And I was lucky enough to spend a solid amount of time here when I was in primary school in Bali where I felt I really absorbed the spirit and I really, um, it made a a very notable imprint on my soul and it was enough of an imprint to call me back when I had my first child and I felt this incredible calling to come home and Uh, The thing that brought me home initially was, um, I'll give you some background first, I guess. I was working in magazines and I was writing about food. And I was writing for a magazine that, uh, an Australian magazine that talked about all kinds of other different cuisines. You know, we wrote about Mexican food, we wrote about Georgian food, we wrote about Italian food. Um, and a lot of other Asian and Southeast Asian cuisines, but I never really had an opportunity to talk about the food of Bali. And I would come home to Bali and I would, you know, be so excited to eat this food again. And I'd go back to Australia and find it very hard to access Balinese food or Indonesian food at all, um, to be perfectly honest. And so there was this, moment where I realized that I had something very special at my home in Bali, which was um, a traditional kitchen where 
we still cook everything over wood fire and my grandmother is an extremely talented cook. Uh, she has been cooking since she was a child and cooking for many people. And a lot of people around Ubud and other parts of Bali, you know, know she's of her. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's got her own little circle of followers and she's now in her early 90s and still cooks today. And so I would often come home and just eat her food and enjoy it for what it was and take pictures of it and think about it when I got home. And then well, after my, my son was born, uh, my connection to Bali deepened in a way because from, from when he was a baby, he would always react to Balinese music. When I was in Bali and I was still pregnant, uh, he would, I could feel him dancing inside my, in my room and he really was the catalyst for me to spend more time at home and connect with my culture in a deeper way because I wanted to be able to share what I had experienced as a child with my son and I wanted to have a deeper understanding of that. And where food comes in is I realized, you know, my grandmother, as I, when I was growing up, she never seemed to age. She was just always the same, you know, she, and then I guess having a child and, and seeing that, um, how rapidly a child grows, I realized, wow, you know, mm -hmm. time is passing by and my grandmother is aging and I, have this incredible opportunity to learn from her, um, learn from her a type of wisdom that isn't often found written in a written form. You know, most of what we know about Balinese cooking has been passed down orally from great grandparents to grandparents to their children to grandchildren. That's just the way um, of the Balinese kitchen, I guess. And so I decided I would make it um, my life's work as a food writer to start to document uh, what I knew about Balinese cooking from my own compound, my own home. Uh, but also that ended up becoming a pilgrimage or a very deep spiritual journey because through the recipes, through the cooking, through the philosophy, through being connected to the elements of the kitchen itself, I had this incredible, what you could only call an awakening um, mm -hmm. as to how important uh, the kitchen is as a place of connection. And it truly, you know, they say that, um, you know, home is where the heart is or home is where the heart is. And mm. for me, that really brought me home, you know. So beautiful. Can I ask what her name is, your grandma? Anak Agungrai. So I just want to honor her. Yes. How, how amazing a woman and, and about at what age is she at? She's, well, we don't know her exact age. She doesn't know her birthday on the Gregorian calendar, but we believe that she's about 93 or in her early 90s. Yeah, it's perfect because I'm so, I'm, I'm so keen and these interviews are really about the wisdom keepers, those people that hold the sacred knowledge and transmit it through the lineage. And you had an intuition that it was important to preserve that and to be, in a way, you're going to be the keeper of that knowledge. So you're a wisdom keeper too. And that's a, it carries a lot of responsibility. So that's amazing that someone like you is prepared to do that. And I suppose it's on my mind to ask you, before you have the epiphany and before you have the awakening of receiving the download or the transmission from your grandmother who's a wisdom keeper oftentimes mythologically people go through a dark night first mm. before they go seeking the inspiration or they find the portal or they find the uplink and can you just give us a sense of what that really complex time maybe it might have been before you went on your search absolutely i mean if i look at most of the years of my life before I had this uh, download or awakening or however you'd like to call it, I think I was very much um, in a dark night phase in that I was just purely disconnected, you know, from the essence 
of all of the things that I was doing. So I feel like I was existing in a place where I was just purely focusing on working. It's quite an emotional thing for me to talk about because in many ways there's a lot of guilt attached to it. There is um, a feeling that I was not being present in in my life in many ways. You know, I was very focused on uh, achieving things on a material sense, and I was looking at food in particularly as uh, in particular as something that was to be enjoyed and consumed for myself or for ourselves something that had to be aesthetically pleasing, something that had to taste amazing, something that was for uh, our own human pleasure, I guess I could say, if we're focusing on the topic of food. And then as I had this connection with my grandmother, I started to realize that, you know, it was so much more than that. It was actually an offering. It was actually a gift from nature. It was actually about so much more than just the human being uh, or the human experience of it. Mm -hmm. And my dark night experience of that was illness, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, for many years I was suffering from what can only be explained as a lack of connection with what I was cooking, what I was consuming. A dissociation. Uh, a dissociation, mm -hmm. yes. I was constantly unwell. Um, but constantly not aware of the fact that the only thing that could treat that was to uh, repair the relationship that I had between food and myself um, and between myself and nature and between myself and spirit, mm. which was something that was really missing from my life when I was living in Australia. And there were many wonderful things about my time in Australia and uh, it's a fabulous place in many ways but the connection that we have here in Bali and the connection that I grew up with I lost while I was over there um, and and I became very upset about that I became I came back to Bali and I felt overwhelmed with all the things that I didn't know all the things that I didn't understand all the ways that I had been shut down as a being for so many years of my life. Uh, and it was through the kitchen, you know, that was the window for me to start understanding uh, what life is about. Um, and not, not, just on a, not just on a personal level, but really on quite a, a collective level. Mm. Um, and so when I came back and, and I started to apply more understanding in everything that I did, including cooking and including eating, my health problems just disappeared. And I can only describe that as a miracle. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the miracle that I feel that my pilgrimage was all about. And it was very interesting to me that um, it came through through the medium of food because when I had finished my career in food writing, or I thought I had finished my career in food writing, I was very sure that I would move on to do something else. I was interested in writing about health because I was dealing with so many issues in my own health. Um, and then food made its way back in and it was a combination of food and, and culture really and and that brought me back into a place of good health and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, there are no, there are no coincidences on the ride. I mean, that's the vehicle for your awakening and you know that moment that you described, I mean, you said it was emotional, I heard the word guilt. The dark night of the soul is about a reevaluation, a hard look at just how lost or disconnected. I mean, just recently with your brother Chalky Day on Mount Abang, I, I think we both went through something very similar. Mm. I mean, I, I was grasping for air and grasping for the next branch to pull myself up this mountain. There was a moment there where I was um, overcome 
by a sense of not the guilt not being as available to my own kids as I really thought I would like to be. Mm. And it's hard to really come to terms with that. Like, it's one thing to be ill, and but it's also like to be physically unwell, but it's another to know that your disconnection is having impact on the people you love the most. Yeah. Um, but I think that, that that marks a very important reckoning that I feel like the time that we're living in in the pandemic is all about, and it's a choice. Mm -hmm. Like you chose to go into it into the illness, into the disconnection. A lot of people have that, what's called, Joseph called, uh, Joseph Campbell called the, the call to adventure. It, it, it is a door or a phone call, if you like, and m many people don't take it. Mm. They just double down and they go back into more work, more of the toxic food, maybe more of the toxic relationship. Uh, so it's a it's an epic archetype on the journey for someone to embrace the darkness and to really have an honest assessment and to have an, a very courageous look. Uh, so that that's a remarkable thing, and there, I don't think you could make it through. It's almost like if you don't if you don't show willingness to go deeper in, then that next milestone when the wisdom keeper comes in whatever form for you it was food and then from food to your grandmother, I imagine, you can't have one without the other. Yes. Yes, and that was the thing that was also uh, a challenge for me at the beginning was particularly, you know, I'm, I'm half Balinese, but I'm also half Australian and uh, loving something so much, but having a deep down, having a fear of sharing what I loved and the wisdom that I'd received from my grandmother, from having this feeling of being an imposter in a way, you know, that was a big challenge for me in many ways. Uh, and so yeah, through this passage, I've really, I've realized also that um, this is a very universal concept that we talk about in the book. And I co-authored this book with my friend, Wayan Krishnayasa. Mm. Uh, we a fellow together, pilgrim. A fellow pilgrim. <laughs> and he also has an incredible story. You know, he comes from Nusa Penida and uh, his journey has taken him all around the States where he cooked. Um, in many, many different kitchens, uh, returning to Bali to then cook the food of his ancestral lineage. And then for us to come together and share what has been shared with us has been very scary in many ways because um, a lot of it, you know, there are a lot of different opinions about it. Bali is a very diverse island. Every different region has its own um, take on things, if you like. And so for us to share this has been, yeah, a very, we've had to go through many different um, emotional ups and downs to be able to get to this point. But it felt very natural and it felt like now was the time to share, particularly during a time where um, you know, we started this book in the middle of 2020, so it was right smack bang in the middle of COVID and people have been locked down and that nourishment, that connection, uh, the freedom to explore that Balinese cooking offers us, you know, I think that is something that will be very helpful for people going forward. Returning the soul and the spirit and the philosophy into something like cooking mm. during a time where I feel the world is so hungry for soul. That's something you were saying earlier is mm. that the soul is gone. And I think one of the main messages that we've tried to get across is that it is still very possible to cook with soul. Uh, and there's so much that we can learn from traditional kitchens you know, not just in Bali, but from all around the world. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, and although we may not be able to replicate it exactly the way we do it here in Bali, in a kitchen in the United States or in Australia, there's, there are so many beautiful um, concepts that we can take from this traditional kitchen in particular. Uh, and we can interpret that in our own way, in a more universal way. This is what I think is, I'm, not, I'm getting very excited now because I, it's, a, it's dawning on me as I listen to you that the, the pervasive impoverishment that our global society is experiencing, the lack of soul, the lack of connection to spirit, the lack of con the connection to the land, it has now manifested in every discipline, in every sector of life. And of course, it's, a, it's like almost very obvious that we need to return to spirit. But the wonderful thing I'm getting from you, which I think is a very simple but very elegant and very profound teaching, is that spirit can come back in many forms. Spirit doesn't have to look like a yoga posture in a shala or a prayer in front of a shrine. Mm -hmm. And I think, at least for me, that's the most obvious go-to as a portal or a doorway in, or a doorway back, if you like, a reconnection. But I think what you're saying brings up to me some of the Zen poetry where the immediacy and the presence of spirit comes through just drinking tea mm -hmm. or through a flower arrangement or through a conversation and through food. I mean, food is so central that we take for granted and yet we are bombarded by high calorie, low substance, lack of nourishing food. And so as, a, as an archetype or symbol, it's so profound. Mm -hmm. So before we launch into the book then and like the maybe top three gifts of your discovery and your pilgrimage of the book writing, was there also an auspicious encounter with your co-writer? was How was that meeting characterized? Well, our meeting, we first met uh, when I was interviewing Wayan about his cooking um, for an Australian magazine. And I'd been thinking about writing a book for many years, but the thing with Balinese food is that, as I explained earlier, it's it's so multi-layered. Um, it's such a big task for one person to uh, communicate it in its entirety. And, you know, I know what my grandmother has taught me, but the moment that Wayne and I met, I thought this is really interesting because we can have a masculine and feminine expression of what Balinese cooking is. Wayan comes from Nusa Penida, so he grew up fishing and he has a really uh, deep knowledge of seafood and, and of, um, you know, the ingredients of Nusa Penida, which is a very dry island that where rice doesn't grow and they use a lot of corn and cassava and things like that for starch. And so there was this immediate synergy and I knew that Wayan also wanted to share. And so we had been talking about it for many years after that and life got in the way. And when COVID happened, um, I had actually been on a pilgrimage and I'd prayed at a temple, which is um, called Puncak Penulisan, up at the very um, top of Bali. I think, I believe it's the highest altitude temple on the island. Mm. And as I was praying there, I just basically asked for permission, if we have permission to communicate this knowledge, please may we be allowed to do it. And uh, in the weeks that followed, everything came into fruition in a really beautiful way. And so it was really wonderful to work together, to be able to explore the island together. And also for me, you know, with COVID came this feeling of great isolation and to be able to create with other people was a very beautiful thing. And I think that's a beautiful reflection of the Balinese kitchen where you need many hands on deck in order to create uh, even a simple spread. You know, there needs to be um, 
someone to light the fire, people to... It takes to, a village to it raise takes a, a child. Village. It takes a village to deliver a Balinese meal. Yes, <laughs> it does. And one of the most beautiful parts of that is the laughter and the conversation and the connection, the human connection that happens um, within that experience of making a meal. Uh, it's still very much a communal thing, although eating is more of a solitary thing, the actual production of the meal itself and the process is very communal. And I've had some of the best conversations yes. ever um, in the kitchen with my grandmother, with my friend Yorman, with my dad when he's able to get in the kitchen because everybody's guard is down. You're only there to prepare that meal. You're not pretending like you know everything, you know, it's, it's, you can ask someone for advice on, does this smell good? Should I add more chili? Do I need to add more salt? Can you help me tie up this bird? You know, there's all of this uh, beautiful, simple humor in, in human interaction that I feel was very much removed from us during COVID. Um, that ability to just be present and be light and be creating something together. So I feel it was very symbolic that this was a collaborative effort. Um, and the upholding of Balinese cuisine, Balinese tra traditional cuisine in itself is also a collaborative effort between, uh, you know, the elders of our island who still very much cook according to the old ways and the younger people that are learning from their grandparents and are putting in the effort to keep cooking the way that they've been taught to cook mm. and not cut corners and still use, you know, foraged ingredients mm. or coconut oil. Um, this is all a very much a team effort that, you know, if it weren't for all of these people working together to keep this cuisine alive in the way that it's been kept alive, then it would be lost. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a real feat that it hasn't been lost because in many ways, Bali is a very modern island. You know, we have, we have shopping malls, we have technology that is on par with many other places in the world. And yet, uh, ritual and cultural traditions are still going very strong here and a very connected to lineage and to the old ways. And I think it's a very special place in the world because you don't often see that happening. You know, you often see the modern and the contemporary completely take over, yes. but our culture here is so closely guarded that um, it manages to coexist with the modern and the contemporary. And when it comes to food, it's very interesting because, you know, we have all of these incredible artisanal products uh, from, from different cultures. We have great croissants, great cheeses, amazing sourdoughs, all of these things that you, could, uh, you would never imagine being in Bali maybe 30 years ago. So we have, we have that world and then we have the traditional culinary world, um, which is going just as strong, particularly in the rural parts of Bali. Uh, and that's something to be proud of, I think, because it's not too extreme in either direction. It's quite balanced. Um, and that's a really lovely, hopeful way to look at it. You know, sometimes it's easy to get carried away in this uh, more negative cycle of saying, you know, the old ways are dying and everything's being cooked with genetically modified foods or you know, there's an infiltration of different cuisines from other places or nobody appreciates the traditional cuisine. But the way I look at it is that the traditional cuisine is very much being appreciated in traditional homes, in ceremonial contexts, um, in quite a lot of restaurants now. And I don't think it's a bad thing for the other things to exist. Yes. I think it's wonderful that we can be balanced and we can appreciate everything. So can I just, if you if you're, think about Balinese and culture that has allowed that integrity to be preserved in parallel. Well, you mentioned earlier 
uh, earlier you talked about spirit and spirit is very much present in the traditional kitchen and I'll explain in more detail in a moment but I think the fact that spirit is present in our traditional kitchens means that in a way these traditional kitchens have been protected and preserved because the energy of spirit is very much there so as an example um, you know I was taught growing up that Brahma is in the flames of the stove and Vishnu is in the water and so when Brahma and Vishnu work together we have creation you know we we combine the fire and the water with the rice which is the goddess of abundance Dewi Sri and we are given this gift of food and so offerings are actually placed in the kitchen uh, in traditional kitchens and even in modern kitchens every day so I feel that that's the starting point because once you acknowledge the kitchen as an altar of sorts and the food that comes out of there Maya, as, come on this is incredible well this is where for me I I realized you know cooking is very much a spiritual experience and that's not to say we need to take it too seriously but we need to protect the ways and the recipes and the ingredients that we've been offered by the universe um, because what we're cooking it's in a sense it's divine it's an offering you know and that and that energy then goes back into the, into us which in turn goes back into our family into our landscape and so I feel the fact that spirit um, is present in the kitchen it's even present in the food you know um, in the ingredients I mean, themselves that's so I, that's the most amazing notion such a beautiful notion that really struck me right there and I, but I also now I see that there's a reciprocity because it's not just the ingredients what you're talking about is a state of mind a reverence mm. I mean to the way you just described how easy it would be to just see the water as water or the flame as flame. So there is something from our side that re-envisions it or sees it as it actually is, as a divine, as a divinity. Mm -hmm. But then you're also talking about, when I asked you, what is it about the Balinese culture that would preserve this parallel track? You, you basically, if I heard you correctly, was that it's being guided by spirit. So there is this, reverence and spirit protection that is happening in the arena of the kitchen yes and I, that, i've just never heard it put like that so thank you so much it's uh it's once you once you look at the kitchen in this way you can apply that to any kitchen yeah. you know even if you're flicking on a gas stove, there is still that flame there that still represents or symbolizes the manifestation of God that is creation. Um, and so I think that's one part of it. And I think another part of it is that um, a lot of traditional recipes um, are also used as tools for devotion or offering. Uh, so a lot of the satays, um, there's a variety of what I would describe as a chopped salad, which is called lawar, which is often color coded um, to represent the different manifestations of God. Mm -hmm. And so you will have that in an offering. Um, a lot of the cakes as well, traditional cakes. And in everyday offerings themselves, you know, even the offerings to the, the lower energies or the elemental energies, um, there'll be rice and a bit of chicken and things like that. And so when you have uh, recipes that need to be protected because they are offerings and every ingredient in there has a purpose, um, then they carry on and they don't become modified because that is something that needs to be, you know, very much left as it is. Yeah. 
And I think that's a really special thing. Um, people don't mess with the formulas too much because they're divine formulas that are the way they are for a reason. And uh, it also means that, you know, it's important for us to have the traditional kitchen setting and not a modern kitchen because a lot of these recipes require um, not only a lot of space to prepare them, mm. um, but they need to be cooked over wood fire or coconut husk. They're often double cooked um, and they need to be made in big, uh, in large amounts or in many portions, particularly if it's for a big ceremony or something like that. And so um, the only space that is conducive to that is a traditional kitchen, really. Mm. And then you have that beautiful smoke element that comes through that, you know, many Balinese people will attest to the fact that rice always tastes better when it's cooked over wood fire. Mm. It has that smokiness and people are still so attuned to the old ways of cooking here that they're able to taste if something is cooked over fire or cooked over a stove. And we naturally lean for the stuff that is cooked the old way. So I think that's one reason. And another one, the third reason why I feel the traditional ways have stood the test of time is because we still are so lucky to be surrounded by so much nature. And what that means is a lot of the native ingredients that grow wildly around us, uh, like ferns and bamboo shoots, um, different types of tree leaves which are used as vegetables, so mango leaves and papaya leaves and cinnamon tree leaves um, are still growing wildly all around us. And so people get really excited when they have the opportunity to forage these foods and cook with these foods. And um, we're at a point now where either we're going to completely forget about this knowledge and only shop from supermarkets or mm. even markets where you still get a little bit of variety. You can still find, you know, your fern tips and things like that. But um, there's also the monoculture, m agricultural vegetables like your carrots and cabbages. And they've made their way into the cuisine in, in one way or another. But um, yeah, now we have a choice as to whether we completely go down that road or we keep learning about the plants and, and ingredients, uh, the wild growing plants and other ingredients that we used to cook and start putting more energy towards that. Um, or I guess there is a chance that, you know, we will lose a little bit of that wisdom, but I think there is quite a strong movement of people wanting to go back to the traditional native plants and ingredients. And there's still so much nature around us. So we don't even need to put that much effort into growing it. It's just more about knowing what it is, how to find it and how we can cook with it. And while we still have our grandparents' generation around, mm. I feel it's really the time to speak with them, learn from them, uh, forage with them if they're still able to do that and bring this back to life because when we are eating the native plants what we get on our plate is basically a reflection of our landscape which is something that's very special um, and we're in a very unique part of the world where um, Although Bali is not a very large island, the landscape tells many stories in, in, you know, in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west. And I feel like now is a very potent time to be, yeah, exploring the regional uh, plants and recipes of Bali, which is always a very special experience for me. I love to, um, I love particularly to dine in people's homes or in temples when, when you're fed at the end of a ceremony. And 
look at the different ways that ingredients are reinterpreted. And mm. you'll be amazed that on such a small island, there are so many different interpretations of ingredients and dishes. I was, that's what I was going to ask you. So you naturally made a segue. And we still haven't gotten into the book, but we're getting into the spirit of the book. But there's, there's often a philosophical question that I ask people, and this fits naturally right here, this dance between preserving the traditional and innovating. Mm -hmm. And you're right on the cusp, Maya, because you're the receiver of your grandmothers, and I think the grandmother is a great archetype. I mean, this is talking about the divine feminine and the download coming through the lineage, the feminine lineage, and your intentionality to preserve the traditional. I mean, when you're talking about the rice cake or the offering having a sacred constitution that has to be respected, it can't be adjusted or adapted. And then you and I have also talked, and elsewhere, talked elsewhere about not everything in the tradition can continue or should continue. Mm -hmm. And there's almost like a great subtle determination that has to happen about what gets preserved because it's so vital and important and in in a way indispensable and yet as as a young person coming through and you're going to take it forward you have to make a determination about how to do that wisely for a new generation mm. you have any thoughts on that it's a it's something that i think about Often, you know, there are many challenges when it comes to combining the two worlds, um, those being the traditional world and the sort of modern material world that for many years I felt sort of forced to be a part of in order to survive. Um, and I think COVID has been a really interesting catalyst into how much of that do we actually need or how much of that has uh, have we been molded into thinking that we need you know and so that has been something very interesting in terms of innovating the tradition going forward for me personally that's a difficult one to to answer because in many ways I wish that I was more steeped in many of the traditions. You know, I, I feel, and I touched on this earlier, that earlier in my life I'd been quite disconnected and then I've come back and had to learn and, and relearn and understand. And there have been many moments where I've stopped and gone, gosh, I don't actually know how I can balance the two because I'm, I have so many um, obligations over here mm. and I don't, and I have my obligation as a mother or my, my beautiful, incredible role as a mother that I love very much. And then, you know, the role of traditional life, which um, is very special and important to me and is sort of a, a collective obligation that all of us have here in Bali in order to retain spirit and retain the energy and retain the culture. So I feel that for me personally, it's about sitting down and really almost, you know, not even writing down or just thinking about my various roles, thinking about how I can apply enough time and energy and love to all of them without feeling resentment, without feeling pressure, uh, without looking at it as, as something that I have to do. It has to be all done out of love. Mm. Um, and that applies to all parts of my life now, not just the cultural. I have to I've made it my goal to approach everything from a place of love and enthusiasm and, and energy and to not 
uh, moan and groan about anything that I need to do because I am pressured, because I don't have time, because I don't feel that it aligns with me. As a human, that's not easy to do, I think, you know. And um, it's a very important exercise, I think, for anyone anywhere in the world to do because I feel that in the past many times, even when I'm not here and when I'm somewhere else, I've tended to do things out of fear or out of stress or out of, you know, obligation. obligation. And it's really important to turn that word obligation into love. Mm. And that is, um, it's a difficult thing to do at times. But when I look at the way Bali operates and I see how rituals are given so much love and attention and time, um, it's almost like work comes second. Yes. And coming from an Australian background where work came first and being a good citizen came first and being a good wife or partner came first and being a good mother came first and having enough me time came first. That really turned, coming back here really turned the way that I looked at the world on its head because I, I started to go, wow, actually, you know what? Faith comes first, uh, devotion comes first, community comes first, um, mother nature comes first, you know, all of these things. And it's not even about them coming first. It's yeah. just that um, the same amount or even more of our energy goes towards that. And by committing this these selfless acts of sacrifice so sacrificing your time um, sacrificing what you make in order to be able to make offerings um, sacrificing being able to go on a holiday whenever you want or things like this by making that sacrifice you in turn feed your own spirit your own soul um, but you also contribute to the collecting, healing or preservation of your community and your landscape and all of the unseen um, that are here, you know, coexisting with us, protecting us, maybe at times challenging us. Um, but we, we tolerate everything that exists, not just what is within our own world. And when I think about innovating tradition, you know, sometimes I often think by innovating, we almost have to look backwards a little bit and look at what was happening in the past and how we can apply the parts at work mm -hmm. in our current modern lives, which I think are in a big transformational phase at the moment because everything kind of paused for a while mm. and a lot of the obligations of my material life over the past two years have really faded into the background and I've been able to you know be more present in my home life be more present in my family life and uh, contribute to my culture from a place of pure love and devotion because I, I wasn't thinking about all the other stuff that I needed to do. I'd almost just let go of it all because there was a period during COVID where I almost had nothing. Um, and I was writing this book and I was very grateful to be doing that. But it was the first time in my life that I'd had no financial security and I was completely in the hands of the sky. And I was very grateful to have, um, to be in a place where I could still communicate with nature and, and with the universe and know that I was being held. And that is an incredible gift that Bali gives to all people who 
have been drawn here for a reason and, and, and give back, you know. I think the giving back to any, any place or space is really important. And that happens every day here, like clockwork. You know, every day um, we acknowledge what is beyond us. Every day we give to what is beyond our, our, our eyes. And we live in a way that is, um, is really about attaining harmony on so many more levels than just the physical level or the material level. Mm-hmm. And so to answer your question about innovation, I think in many ways it, it comes down to uh, the individual's experience and what, what what you're willing to sacrifice and able to attain this state of um, all-encompassing harmony, that takes some work and there's no kind of one-size-fits-all answer for it. And during that process, you're also going to have to consider, um, consider consider other people that are around you in your community. You're going to have to consider your landscape. Um, you're going to have to consider uh, how you are going to survive, I guess, as well. And there's a real art to it. And my, I take my hat off to every young Balinese person at the moment um, because, you know, we have a lot of um, responsibility to retain a culture, um, to raise our families, to, uh, to be hospitable to the many visitors that come to the island as well. And I think, um, I think everybody handles it with such grace. It's been a very difficult time financially for Bali. Um, and people are still smiling and people are still uh, incredibly faithful. And I think that's really, that's something that's very special. The faith is still very strong. As as a recipient, as a guest here, I, I feel an immense amount of respect for how the culture is able to receive with such dignity and grace. It's it's really a remarkable thing, especially when you can just scratch the surface and see how challenging the situation is. Before we finally get into the book, I guess I want you to share one or two stories from the book, but there was one thing that you said in there in the context of this not tension as much as reconciliation between valuing and preserving the past and innovating in the fo- in the future for the future you you describe what i would consider an alchemical process of transforming obligation into love i think that's a very strong statement i mean i i'm, I'm holding on to that in my mind because at least from a karmic point of view, obligation is not a clean or pure motivation in which to conduct a ceremony or to preserve something or to say a mantra or to make an offering. It's it's almost like cross-contaminated, really, from a very a very uh, subtle imprint. The sense of I mean, they describe it in Buddhism that you will always get the good karma of giving, but if your intention is either fear or obligation or loyalty or shame because we can give for so many reasons mm-hmm. there's still some value because the the gesture someone receives something but the impetus no one sees the impetus but your consciousness continues to reap the consequence of it so obligation is such a strong word doing something out of rote habit, for example, the rituals may have some byproduct, but they certainly something else withers on the inside. And a sort of doing something out of pressure, loyalty or obligation, I can really see that as diminishing the quality of the act. And so your 
the psychological process of transforming that obligation into love so that it reignites the gift of the giving. It really infuses it with its full force. I think that's a really powerful metaphor and I kind of want to, I'll probably jump to the end by just saying it now because it fits here as this book is your, is your gift. Mm. And it doesn't, it doesn't look like a traditional mandala that you offer how do you call the mandalas here with the on the on the on the on the banana leaf with the five different colors in it uh, yes, what are yes. those called um, at every shrine yes other chana chana i mean your book is your chana yeah and so that's that's where i see you've reconciled the two because it's still the purity of making an offering that respects tradition but it's done in this contemporary way mm -hmm. and it fuses and gathers your life experience even your pilgrimage of discovering that certain certain elements of the food industry had lost their sentiment or their purity that's still part of your gift. It brought you here. Mm -hmm. it, it was part of it. And now it's incorporated into this gift and into this book. And it's a beautiful offering. You know, I haven't get, you. yet seen it, but I, I'm so honored that it's coming. And this conversation really shows just how much depth is really interspersed through it. So with that in mind, you want to share a couple of stories that highlight the book and sort of tease people into feeling like they can make a karmic connection to intersect with your work? Yes, well, thank you very much. I feel very touched to have um, this book, this project described as an offering. And I can say that um, in many ways it has felt like uh, it's been a vessel for me to to give back to Bali and say thank you in my own way. Um, after having spent so many years away and still have been um, gifted with uh, this knowledge that has really helped me on an individual level. So very much energetically for me, it felt like an offering, but to hear someone else describe it as that is is very touching. So thank you. Um, some stories. Well, there are many, many stories. Um, Wayan has stories in there about his childhood in Nusa Penida, which... Sorry to interrupt, but stories that you showed me some beautiful photographs too. Yes. Maybe the stories and the image can go really lovely together. You can just at least paint the picture in our mind of the image. Yes. So there's a, there's an image of Wayan on his boat going out fishing in Nusa Penida and he tells the story of his childhood there which um, was incredibly uh, connected to the ocean, family driven and really really beautiful. It, what he does through his essays is paint a picture of a very different kind of Bali that um, it's hard to understand if you've only been on the main island, but Panida is a very arid island. Um, they have to grow a lot of their food up in the hills. Um, it can be very difficult in the dry season when there's no rain, uh, and they're very reliant on the ocean. So they have this incredible relationship with the ocean, and it, it's an island that's full of magic. And so he tells um, a few stories about his life over there, which I think are very special. And then I, I have a few different kinds of essays in there. There's one that is a conversation between myself and my grandmother as we're making urab in the kitchen, which is like a, a warm salad with um, fern tips and spice paste with lots and lots of different spices and uh, coconut. And she's talking to me about love, um, which is a very interesting topic coming from my grandmother because she was married to a man that had, um, let's say, more than one wife. He had many wives. So I got an interesting insight into what love meant to her mm. um, and what 
what life and dharma meant to her really uh, through that conversation and there's another conversation uh, between myself and and Nyoman who's cared for me since I was a young child and um, we're talking about the rice field foraged foods that she used to eat when she was growing up because her farmer uh, her father sorry worked in the rice fields and so she has very fond memories of um, finding snails and dragonflies and and little eels and um, all of these foods that we would now now you know classify as um, interesting or exotic but really they're just you know real uh, real foods from the earth interesting proteins um, so she talks about that which is really nice because um, you know growing up I I didn't have so many of those foods um, so that was really quite a journey for me to talk to her about the actual process of being with her father in the fields and, and the joy behind the collection of the ingredients that then went into the foods that are still, you know, very much imprinted in her memory as, um, as comfort foods, you know, foods that take her back to her childhood. And then we also have, um, a story about a journey that Wayan and I took through uh, through the middle of the island, through the mountains, and then up to North Bali. Um, we try all kinds of different foods along the way, and we finish uh, at a temple in Tabanan, which you're familiar with, um, Pura Batupanas, mm. and. Um, we finish with a meal there and that for me was a really special part of the book where we got to step out of the comfort of our own kitchens and experience other people's cooking and other people's ingredients and for both of us we we stepped away from what we knew and we were completely open to relearning and there was so much to learn there were so many ingredients that we hadn't seen before um, so many different cooking techniques and that was like a moment that meant a lot to me because I knew that you know when things start feeling stagnant or when you want to become inspired and you can't get on an airplane and leave there's you know all you have to do is travel a few hours and there's a completely different culinary and cultural landscape to learn from and um, that drew me much closer to Bali in many ways because I just so enjoyed being able to look at things familiar things from a different perspective which we're really good at doing here in Bali I must say you know I'm always learning that might also come from the fact that I haven't been here my entire life and you know, my mother is from a different, a different country and culture, and uh, there's still a lot for me to learn. But one of the great pleasures of being here is that is that sharing and learning is nothing to be ashamed of. It's something that is um, very open, and it is something that uh, happens in in day to day life that I'm very grateful for. Yes, it's a beautiful, beautiful way to culminate the conversation because it's, it's reminding me of a quote and I can't remember who it is and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it has to do with the return of a pilgrimage that you, you end up returning where you started, but the difference is you have fresh eyes. Mm. The journey gives you a set of fresh eyes. And I guess, you know, we're here at the end of the conversation, so let me allow you to share a blessing or a hope or an aspiration as you make your offering of this book to Bali and to the world, you know, what it is that you hope people get, take away from it and what, what, can, what can come about this generous gift that you've offered. So I guess my, my hope is that people will receive this as an honest sharing and be able to see 
the pilgrimage that was involved in order for it to come to life and hopefully embark on a pilgrimage themselves. Mm. You know, and that, that doesn't mean they need to go far. It, it can be, um, mm. it can almost be an internal pilgrimage where we re-look at the way we, we treat food. Um, we readdress the way that we look at the kitchen. We readdress the way that we source ingredients and we return spirit to all of these things. You know, look at everything that, that you put inside your body, everything that you cook with your hands, everything that you receive from the earth um, as a gift and turn that into an offering. And to remember that even the process is a gift. Mm. I think, uh, I think that is my message. You certainly did that during the course of this discussion. You brought us through every one of those points. So it's been a pleasure to get to know you and to share in this conversation and others. And I very much look forward to one day cooking in the kitchen with you. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to that too. And all best wishes with the launch of the book. And thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Lars. That's beautiful. <laughs> that was really, really lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. That was really wonderful. Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Caper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.